Hi there, I'm Ron Lees, fishing here on the banks of the River Severn today, hopefully to catch some barbel. The conditions are not perfect for it, but I've got a sneaking suspicion we might catch one or two. I think it's fair to say that Holt Fleet is the home of the bigger barbel, in as much as up the middle of the Severn, a few miles upstream. A lot of the fish that are caught up there are pound, two pound fish. Very unusual here at Holt Fleet to catch a barbel under three pound. And if there are any born here, I think they're born at two pound. The uh, river in the section I would think holds fish to 16 pound. That might sound stupid to people who talk in terms of 14 pound barbel being specimen and approach in that area. But under the weir just up there a few years ago, I seen a salmon angler catch a fish which I gave a conservative estimate to be 15 to 16 pound. He caught it on a prawn, totally disgusted, and he put it back as vermin. Today I shall be using three methods to catch the barbel. A, the meat method, rig of which I've got in my hand. Secondly, the feeder method, which is the most prevalent way of catching barbel on the Severn. I'm not madly in love with the method, but it's an excellent way of catching barbel. And last but certainly not least, I'll be using the stick float method down the inside lane here. I think um, barbel are an idle fish, essentially, and the bigger fish do tend to hug the inside because they do not like competing with the boats and the currents in the middle of the river. Plus the fact, of the course, that the edges and the margins are the natural home of any normal food such as worms, slugs, barbellas, anything that falls on the water, the barbel will eat it. I think if barbel grow to a massive size, they'd eat people. We've heard stories of pike attacking dogs. It might have been a barbel. Anyway, that's enough for this place for the moment. A um, little bit of history of the river and the barbel. They were introduced in 1956 with an influx of 500 odd fish which were put in at Noel Sands and Arley that came from the River Kennet. This was considered to be a success and later on during the year they put some more fish in, a few hundred, up in the bridge north down to um, Noel Sands area. No barbel showed any great quantity for five years or so and then one or two fish were started being caught and then the great boom came in the middle 70s where match catches to 100 pounds were being caught. Uh, people like Des Taylor, the Bowdens in the Bewdley area, they, they were mostly comprised of fish to the pound mark and they was catching them one a chuck as in bleak fishing. But you don't catch bleak a pound a piece. So the barbel were coming in fast and furious all on the swim feeder method. Since then they've spread up and down the river, up all the tributaries, the river Salwarp, certainly the river team. I think the river team now holds a lot of record barbel. Of that there is no doubt. But it's a small river and difficult to get them out. Here on this river there's a lot of snags which do cause problems but I'm a great believer that where there are snags there are fish. I think I've rattled on about that little bit of it enough now so I'm going to start by talking about the meat. Put that down there for a moment. Right, that is a tin of plum rolls chopped ham with pork. Less the tin of course because it is illegal up and down this river to take any tins on the bank side because of the danger to children, cows, any animals that may run up and down. Can cause an accident, so we do leave the tins at home. I've cut it into sections, roughly half inch thick, which makes it easier to break little bits and pieces off, which I'll go into later. I would prefer not to use cubes, I think it's, it's totally irrelevant to anything you do, and it makes it harder to hook the fish. But I'll go through the rig of the meat before I go into the detail of the meat itself. Why I use plum rose chopped down with pork is um, there's a lot of stories bandied about that I like it and as much as a fish that's why I buy it. That's not quite true. I like it because the consistency of the meat, I can, uh, it sticks on the hook a lot easier and I don't have to put any little bits and pieces on to hold it on the hook. I've seen people use matchsticks, bits and pieces of grass, I've got no doubt that people have tied adaldite and cascamite and probably even super glue. There's no need for it if it's put on the hook properly I'll demonstrate later, it stays on the cast, no problems whatsoever. Just go down to the rig now. I'll start off with the rod of course. This blank, it was a nine and a half foot blank when I first bought it and I first made this in 1974. It was a northwestern blank at nine foot four inches and I think I chopped four or five blanks about before I came to what I would think is the nth degree for a meat rod. It's ended up at eight foot nine inches long. Certainly a bean pole, but a nice rod, a little bit lesser, and I can use a two and a half pound line quite confidently with this. Today I'm using a 4.4 line because I'm in the area of big barbel, and should I eat a big fish, I don't want to do it no damage by leaving the hook in the mouth. So if I do hook one, 
a little bit of luck I should get the, the uh, fish out okay. That line is loaded onto a 506 reel in this case because when a barbell runs I don't want to give it too much back pressure. I've taken the reverse drag out of it so this can rack wind quite freely as I've demonstrated there. Other than that the reel's not doctored at all, it doesn't need anything. The uh, rings I've used on this rod are of the hardened variety because constant fishing with, with a ledger, fishing for barbell with a meat, the barb will run a lot and you're winding in a lot and lines going out a lot under pressure therefore you want good hard inserts on whichever type of um, ring is used on this particular rod. The quiver tip, a lot of people don't use quiver tips these days, I preferred it for the very good reason is it's a good bite registrator, I can get tremendous bite registration from it. I'm going to pull that line a little bit now. Now you can see that when that rod's under pressure, all the pressure is taken from the fish direct and then the top ring through the rod. So what I'm trying to say on that is once the registration is being given and the fish is hooked, that quiver tip is out of the game and it's a screwing quiver tip. If it was a built-in quiver tip, it would become an integral part of the action of the rod, which is what I don't want. I'm quite adamant about them. The line is straight through from the reel, direct to the hook. There's no knots at all between that hook and the reel. The only knot is, is where the link is tied to the reel there, which is stopped, in this case, by two number four shots, which I've squeezed on fairly tightly with my teeth. I don't like any knots, I don't like any ledger stops, it's just my way, and that's how I feel confident to do it. Occasionally, those shots do slip upon a strike. When that happens, I'll replace them. It's as simple as that. No great mechanics at all. I think it's fair to say that the whole success of my meat fishing has been the, the, what I call the angles. That angle there. And I gain that by doing a 2 to 1 ratio. I get my hook link twice as long as my lead link. When it's, when it's down the river, in this particular case, the river's about 10 foot deep, that angle there by playing with the line on that point there, I can make the meat dance. It's a cat and mouse business. Fish are like human beings. Show them something, occasionally they won't need it, and they'll just sit there looking at it. But if you try to remove it from them, it's nature, animal nature, they'll jump at it and they'll bite at it. And I catch a lot of fish by doing that, making that meat dance a little bit. But to do that, I must have that angle right, depending on the depth of the river. To hold the bottom, I used a flattened bomb. Now this was a one and a half ounce flattened bomb, it probably looks a little bit bigger than that, but what's happened in actual fact, I'll hold it sideways like that, it's flattened with a hammer to that point there, now you can see the actual breadth of it. It's got the built-in swivel being a normal Aussie bomb. With a, a, a normal bit of a river with no snags, a two ounce lead will roll by action of the river, that's common sense. Push on the line, a lead will roll but by flattening it like that, it lies on the bed and I only have to use half of what would be required if it was a rolling bum. That's self-explanatory. That can be done quite easily by putting a, one and a, a two ounce lead on a flat board and blowing it, it'll roll. Put a half ounce lead on that same board and try to blow it and it don't roll, common sense. I think that's just enough about the rig. I'll just explain one little bit about it. The position of the reel to that ring there is fairly important because the bite registration is felt through that forefinger on the line there. That's where I feel my bites. I don't wait necessarily for the rod to curl over. I think I've gone through the rig a little bit now. Just demonstrate how to put a little bit of meat on. One other thing I've not mentioned about the rig of course is a hook, which is probably the most important part of it, so I'm stupid enough not to mention it. This is a Mustad 406 hook. The original hook I found for it in 1975 was again a Mustad, but it was a 39082. It was a wonderful hook, but Mustad in their wisdom seemed fit to discontinue it over the size 14, and it took me four years to find this one. It's a blued hook, it's slightly reversed, which means it's bent sideways. It keeps its sharpness, and it's a wide gape. That is probably the most important factor of it, the wide gape. With a normal, shall we say, a crystal type of hook, I'd probably need a size zero, or certainly a size one. That is a size six. It's a marvellous hook. Once it's in a fish, I've never yet had one fall out. Now the meat. As I've said, I just pinch a lump out of the side just like that. 
and that I break into two. Now you can begin to see now why I do not use cube meat. I just thread the hook through that, slide that piece up the line, leaving it there at a moment, and another little bit. That piece sits on the bend of the hook, not up the shank, on the bend of it there, like that. Then that one is slid down, covering the rest of the shank. A lot of little bits and pieces hang sideways out. This, I think, is natural ground bait. When a fish goes and has a little bit of smell, shows a little bit of interest, starts smelling around, a little bit of suck, and he barbel works his barbules, little tiny bits flake off. So he has a little bit of the icing on the cake, and he thinks, that's nice, I'll have a chomp at that. Bang, away he goes, chomps at it, tip goes round, one leash strikes, and I've got a barbel on the end, which I hope to do just now. The cast let it hang free. There's no need for none of the wild overhead casting at all when you're fishing the meat. I think the river's about 30 yards wide here. I could put that bomb on the far bank with no hard work at all. So, nice gentle underarm cast. Set it down gently onto the bottom. Get it balances, it's down now. Take up the loose line. I'm facing downstream. Now, it is a very important part of meat fishing. There's a metal pin on the abu reels which stops the line. On a strike, that could easily break on that pin. That's clicked off, and now that line is resting on my finger. And that is my fishing position. The line there, holding my forefinger to pick up the tiny plucks that the barbel do give, even a big barbel, will be hooked with just a tiny pluck. When the rod goes over three foot, that is not a bite. That's a barbel or a chub that's felt the hook, he's hooked himself and he's running. Because no fish, no human being, no nothing feeds by going three foot. So, let's catch a barbel. I don't really know when the uh, method actually started on the river. The first I heard about it was in a, in a book by Bernard Benables, and he made reference to the fact that in 1898, the people of that time used to catch barbel on the River Thames on beef. Now, I just read that in a book and I paid no more attention to it over the years. And then I started thinking, the matches on the River Severn, the Middle Severn Welfare matches as they were called, and they probably still are, I don't know, because I don't fish that particular match. In the winter, they were getting one with four and five pound of dice, a couple of pound of bleak here and there, and we're talking about three and four hundred peg matches now. To me, that was a bit stupid, because the river is full of big fish, big barbel, big chub, big anything. Now these fish have to feed by virtue of the size. If they didn't feed, they'd die. So even in winter time, periods of high flood, they've got to feed on something. And then I remember this bit I read about Bernard Benables, and that was coincidental with me meeting a fella called Charlie Harbour who came from just down the river, lived a little village on the side of the river, just below Worcester. And Charlie, I discovered, was catching some fish on the river, chub and barbel. But he was, uh, with all respect to him, smashing guy, he was getting a little bit on in years and his eyesight was going. So I watched Charlie a couple of times at Stourport and he certainly caught a few fish and he won a few matches on him in his later times of his match years. And uh, it seemed to me that although he got the basis of the method, it wasn't quite right in as much as he was chucking all over the river, catching a fish from there, fish from there. And I thought that these fish, especially chub, could be a shoaling fish. So I got my act together, I studied it, I got the rod right, I got my tackle right. And just up the river here, here, just up the river here at Holt Fleet is the Holt Fleet Hotel. So to practice the method, I had to go in the hotel, get up a little bit to Dutch Cottage, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, kicking out time, I had to come on the river, pitch black, and fish exactly as I'm fishing now. Feeling for the bites with this finger here. It was tremendous practice, tremendous practice, and it stood me in good stead. Following that particular time in 1975, uh, I don't wish to brag about it, but I won a lot of matches, let me put it like that. I had a fantastic amount of confidence in my ability on the method, I had to go on the matches, the big message, and I had to say to myself, who was going to come second? Because I psyched myself up to say I was going to win. And with that in mind, it's amazing how many matches I did win. 
it's deteriorated just a little bit over the past few years. I think that's a lot to do with uh, nitrates going into the river, acid rain that's attacking this part of the, the country lately. And um, I think I just had a little flick on that one, actual fact. Yes, I did. I missed the bite. That could have been a bream or a hybrid, which have become a species which has taken a great fondness to meat over the past few years in this river. I'm not going to say they're a nuisance because uh, they're all weight in the net in the match, of course. Although, when we're looking for barbel, I suppose they could be considered a little bit of a nuisance fish. A little bit there, and a little bit more on the point. Got a boat out there watching, going past very, very slowly. It's nice to see these boats when they appreciate an angler fishing and they do slow down. Most of them do, of course, but you do get the occasional idiot boat that goes past and puts his foot down just to spoil things. Fortunate that in the minority. They probably can't sleep at night anyway. It's always been considered to be a last chance method, this meat fishing, which I think is a little bit silly because it is a deteriorating method. It's an instant method where I normally would expect to catch the bulk of any culminative match weight in the first hour and a half. They can go pretty potty for the first hour and a half. After that, they deteriorate. And of course, then methods can be changed and you can catch a few fish on other methods. But uh, by and large, it's the, the first hour deteriorating to an hour and a half, then it's normally all over. I don't really know why the river the method deteriorates. I, my own idea of it, I think that uh, the few missed bites that you always get on the meat, the fish regurgitates the little bits and pieces that it sucks off during the bite. And of course, with the current of the river, they slowly wash away downstream, and the fish obviously follow them, because it's a little larder floating away, and they're not going to ignore it. And that's why it deteriorates over the period. The, the bites can be pretty sharp, especially with the bigger fish. Of course, a big fish is big because it's not stupid. It's got a little bit of 18 pence up there. And you don't go gobbling about like the smaller fish do. It has a quick wallop, and if you miss it, a bit of bad luck. Meat, meat trundles away, and the uh, shoals, especially the chub shoals, they'll follow it down. By saying that, this is why I don't use a rod rest. Because these little sharp bump, the bites that you've got to hit, they can be the bigger fish. If they're on the rod rest, do tend to miss them occasionally. Because if it's on the rod rest, invariably your hands will wander and it'll be away from the rod itself. And by the time the little flickers come, you've got your hand to the rod, you're lifting it up, you're struck. A lot of times gone, you've missed the bite. It's a lovely way. I can stand like this for five hours. That was a bite. And that's a nice fish. That's a nice fish. Or what the television ads say, that is a very nice fish. A very, very nice fish. And I ain't going to go on because I've got to concentrate on this one. Good God, that's a nice... <laughs> that's a very nice fish. I've got, to give him a, I've got to give him a bit. He's pulling too much. Yeah, he's... That's quite a, it's quite a big fish. So I don't know whether I'm going to be successful. I'm getting this one out. But, one can but try. Give him a little bit more. It's remarkable how these barbel hug the bottom and go along the bottom. This one's trying to disappear up a mouse hole on the far bank, I think. I've, I've worn a little bit back. Yep, yep. I'd like to say he was <laughs> coming, but he isn't. Whoa, come on, old pal. You don't dislike me that much. Now, yeah, I'm winning a little bit back. It's like walking up a hill of sand, this. You gain five yards and you fall back ten. He's off again. He's off again. Yeah, I can't um, slow him down a little bit. It's wise occasionally to let these fish have a run because they do slow down of their own accord. This one is to... Yeah, he's slowed down now. It's great fun, this, you know. Without mentioning names, it's a lot better than... Neighbours, Coronation Street and EastEnders put together. Yes, he's coming just a little bit. He 
just a little bit, not a lot, not a lot. He's off again, he's off again. Like old Barbel, he's boring a little bit. They don't go in wild 100 mile an hour runs like as in carp, but uh, they do go in a straight line. Not like a chub, they don't head for snags too much. This one might. I know there's a snag down there because there's an old boat down there and he's going straight for it as he's out. It's coming in. Good God, this is a nice fish. Huh? I'm getting too old for this to be quite honest. Young man's game, I've just decided big barbel is a young man's fish. He's nice, he's going for this clump of weed that's out in front of me just... Come on, sunshine. Oh, he's beautiful. Oh my God, he's a nice fish. He's come up there like yours. Come to have a look at me. Fighting well. I've got to be careful with this net. Now he's bellied up, yeah. He's bellied up. That's nice, that's lovely. What a nice fish that is. I have to watch when you land these fish, or any fish for that matter, with the ledger, that he doesn't get tangled up in the landing net. I'm going to sit down to this because I'm going to get my trousers wet and I don't care because he's beautiful. And that is a seven barbel. That is a Holt Fleet barbel. With these big hooks, it uh, is wise to carry a pair of pliers or forceps. It gets a little bit difficult to get the bigger barb out of the fish's mouth occasionally. There we are. Hook back in there. Lovely fish, I'd say round about five and a half pound. Gorgeous fins, solid muscle, nice and solid on the belly. Still struggling, he wants to go in the net. And there is two of the four barbels. One in the scissors, I decide, one on the nose. Four barbels in all. With the very smaller ones, this is how we differentiate them from the gudgeon. Nice fish, five and a half pound. And he's a doll. Now, we're going to catch his dad. My biggest fish on the uh, venue is nine pound four ounces. That was two or three years ago. That was on the meat, incidentally. Two or three pegs up the river. But it was a winter fish, that one. I remember there was snow on the ground. And it was the only bite out of a six hour session. But it was a bite well worth waiting for. And I'm smirking because I'm dead proud of that one. Here we go. With the little bits of meat coming off, I've been here quite a while now, I would think that area is just about dried out, so I'm going to go a little bit farther downstream, trying to chase those bits of particles that I mentioned earlier that have broken off. I'm about 10 yards, 10 yards further down the stream now. Further down the river. A bit big for a stream, this place. Here we are, nicely balanced to the bottom. Well, that's one nice fish under the belt. Makes it feel a little bit better. Makes it all worthwhile, this standing up and arm ache and eye ache and neck ache. Young man's game, definitely, but still exciting even for an old one. I think this um, deterioration of feeding pattern, I think it, it's self-destructive, really, meat fishing. <coughs> Now, soon you've caught your first fish, you start missing one or two bites. After that, you're going downhill as the meat's going down river or a little bit of particles. Now, a mile down there is grimly, and I think when these bits and pieces start breaking off, that's where they probably settle. And on a match, you don't get mile long pegs. So you have to make uh, hay while the sun shines, so to speak. But it's, it's a lovely mat. Oh, that was a nice bite. I don't. I think this is as big as the last one, but still a very nice fish. And I don't honestly think it's well hooked. So I've got to be a little bit, oh my God, he's pulling a bit. I've got to be a little bit careful with this one. That's a nice fish, that's a nice. I don't think this is a barbel, he's bouncing around. I think it's a nice chub actually. I think that's a nice chub. 
Yeah, yeah. Come on, old son. He's gone up the river a little bit this one, a bit unusual. Again, I'm making predictions about what fish I've got on the end. Yeah, it's a, that's a chub pulsing a little bit. I'm still not confident that I've got a very good hook hold on this one. Now, he's going towards these weeds and over this ledge. This blast is in the way. He's in. He's in. Now then, two things are going to happen now. I'm going to do me nothing throw the rod in if it snags tightly. He's coming loose. Got him. He's out. Yeah, it is a chub. It's a two pound chub and half hundred weight of weed, I think. <clears throat> it's a nice fish. It's got a gob on it like a gasometer. That's all chub have. That's a nice seven chub. A little bit lively. Got the opportunity. He's croaking at me now. It's very good class weed we've got in this river seven. Much better than the local bird's nest soup at the local Chinese. I can get that out of his scissors, come out quite nicely. Nice fish, I'd say about, um, get that out of his gills. So about a pound and a half, pound and three quarters. Not a scale out of place. It's not unusual to catch a chub of that size on the meat, but with a normal shell sized chub, they do. Uh, tend to come a little bit faster. Watch that bit of muck out of his gills. I'm going to put him in the net now. He's fla flapping about a little bit. I don't like keeping him out too long. So, nice fish again. And let's have another chuck. You'll see the benefit now of why I don't use too much hardware on the line, swivels and ledger stuff. It just gunges up with weed. Makes life very, very hard. And I think simplicity is the essence of all fishing, in all fishing rigs, all fishing tackle. No comment about the bit I just dropped in. Slide that one down to cover the shank. Well, the hand's a little bit greasy with the fish and the uh, meat. It's not wise to walk into strange pubs when you beat meat fishing, because you smell. You get strange glances. I've gone just the other side of that baited area, rolling down again to where I was. Yep, that'll do fine. You notice that when I'm striking at these fish, there's none of this business upstream and out there. It's a straight bend of the elbow, fast bend of the elbow, up and over the shoulder direct contact with the fish. I find by doing that I hit far greater percentage of bites, which is what meat fishing is all about. The percentage of bites you can hit to the percentage of bites that you get. You never hit 100% ever. I've yet to do it anyway. I'm, I'm feeling a buzz up this line now. It's what Barbel used to do. It's a sort of a, I can only tell a minute electric type of electric shock. A little bit of buzz. Invariably what happens when this type of thing occurs, um, a bite, a bite develops. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on, my son. That is another fish. It's a nice fish. It's a nice fish. His butt has gone straight into them, towards them snags on that far bank. That's a chub, he's out. That's a chub, it's a nice chub as well. It's times like this that we should have took a Charles Atlas course when playing these fish. Certainly very strength consuming, if not time. Oh, he's kiting up that river now. That's a, that's a lovely, oh my word. I love this. I'd sooner be doing this than anything. That's nice, nice. Now, there's a, I know there's a snag up there. There's, some, there's a sunken tree. He's going, come on, come on. Yes, I think. I think I've done him. I think I got him out of that. Now he's coming to this weed bed in front of me. And he's in it. Now we might well lose this fish. We might well lose it. Now I fucking just. Come on, old pal. He's gone. That's nice. He's come out. 
very cooperative these chub if you talk to them nicely if you start shouting and swearing at them invariably you lose them i've got the usual half a ton of weed with me as well keeping the lead out of the net of course <coughs> i shall take this opportunity to have a sit down the rest of these legs <coughs> that's a nice chub nice bronze coloring Caught nicely in the scissors there. That's a lovely fish, about a pound and a half, I would think. I don't want to keep him too long out there. It's noticeable at the tails this time of the year. They're, they're, they're quite nice. There's, some, there's that black stuff coming out of his vent there that I was talking about the roach. Obviously, these chub, they uh, eat that same green stuff that's in the middle of the river at this time of the year. Nice fish. Let's see if we can catch a few more of them. Let him go down to the deeper water. There he goes. A bit more smelly on my legs. About two or three fish now. Um, I think that it's time to start thinking of other methods. What else should we do in very shortly? <coughs> He's throwing in a decent quantity of hemp seed for the stick float method because when uh, I introduce this hemp in quantity, and I'm talking two or three points all at the same time, it kills the swim stone dead for quite a while. But eventually the oil washes down off the hemp seed and attracts the barbel and they come up. And what sometimes happens then, not all the time, but now and again, a million bubbles up to the surface as the barbel sweep into it. It takes two or three fish to do it, and that's where the term vacuum cleaners comes from with barbel. They actually vacuum all the hemp seed up. In doing so, they disturb all the silt and the muck on the bottom, and all these little bubbles come to the top. Of course, once I start looking at those things, and how the barbel are in, then I really get my head down, start attacking the swim with some concentration. I can't see a great deal more happening with this method now. As I say, the deterioration point has come where I honestly think I'm going to be wasting my time if I spend any more concentrated effort on it. Oh, I don't know, the little bite there. Not a great one. Yep, yep, go on. Yep. Missed him. Nice little boy, probably one of those um, hybrid skimmer roach bream. Things I was on about. I'll take the opportunity now to put my hemp seed in there. Yeah, I've missed that bite, giving it a little break for a while. Here's a hemp seed. There's four points there. I'm going to put it all in. I can't reach where I'd like to with the box itself, so I should go to which in a few handfuls, not too much at a time because it falls off the side of the hand. Now on that point there, there's about eight foot of water and it falls over very, very sharply, vir virtually a vertical drop. And it's alongside that ledge that the barbel hold against the flow of the current, the easy flow of the current, not the hard stuff in the middle of the river. A little bit shouting inside, this is why I don't like to put too much in my hand all at the same time. That's better, I've got it somewhat like right now. Now as I'm throwing in this in, what's happening is every fish within 50 yards is scattering in all directions. Including the barbel, if there was any there. Certainly the roach, bleak and chub are going to disappear. Right, just about emptied that. A little swill out. Now, while that hemp seed's settling down, the oil's washing away from it, going downstream grimly. Worcester, Gloucester, and every barbel within that area is going to come up and sit on top of it. I'll just fill this fish for a little while longer on the meat. 
maybe catch a free one on the end of uh, the area that I've been fishing during the past few hours. One little bit of meat come astray there. While I'm fishing this last period on the meat, I shall be looking at that area some few yards down from where I put the hem seed in. And as soon as I see the sign of any activity at all with these little minute bubbles rising to the surface, then I shall change my tactics very, very quickly. It takes about an hour or two to settle down normally. I certainly wouldn't consider it for at least half an hour. Well, I've been down there for half an hour now without a bite. I haven't seen any bubbles come on that hemp seed that I threw in earlier. So I'm going to have a two or three chucks with a feeder, see what happens there. So I'll make the hook safe first. And down with that one, see what we can do on the cruncher. First thing to do is change the height of the rod rest. Because it uh, can be a bit of a waiting game, this feeder fishing. And with the extra length of the rod, it does get a bit tiring. So I like to use a high rod rest for it. That looks fine. Here they are with a cruncher setup. I call it a cruncher setup. A lot of people call it a plastic pig. That thing there, that's the plastic pig. And uh, Loke in Droitwich, Dave Hartle of Dave Hartle's Fishing Tackle, he's seen fit to call it the pig flinger, which is what it is, it flings pigs. A little bit of hemp first. The great barbel attract up this MC, there's no doubt about it. A few casters. Put the cap on, make sure it's still free running. I put a single caster to an 18 hook there. Totally pointless putting four casters onto a number six hook because they're four casters stuck together in the cruncher. They all come out in singles. Settle it down. And there we are. Best to give a little bit of loose line and feed a fish in because uh, a little bit of loose line downstream. There's two bites I look for. One is a tap where the rod taps round, and the other is when the feed has moved off the bottom and the barbel bites, called a drop back bite, and that's possibly the easiest bite to hit. It's a fairly simple way of fishing. It was said in the early stages of uh, the game in the 70s that one could teach a semi-intelligent chimpanzee to fish the feeder in five minutes. Well, I don't know any semi-intelligent chimpanzees. I think it takes a little bit longer than that to uh, get the finer points of the feeder. That's a tap, that's a tap. That's a drop back bite. And that's a hook fish. Yeah, not a bad fish, not a bad fish. Can't give it too much welly on this um, cruncher rig because it's only two and a half pound hook length to an 18 hook. When you get a fish of this size on the end of an 18, it uh, leaves me a little bit breathless. He's taking line. Yeah, not a monster, but he's certainly a bit fish. It's the first fish of the day on the feeder. I don't want to lose him, he's nice. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a lovely action rod this, I must say. It's the best feeder rod I've ever used. He's, I think he's just touched a snag. It may be the feeder on the bottom that's touched the snag. It's sometimes helpful to keep the rod high when that happened, yeah. Oh, that's nice. I think he's pulled the feeder off the snag the fish himself. Very, very decent of him. 
If it's a him, could be a she. Coming slowly. I do worry sometimes about 18 hooks when I'm feeder fishing. But then again, if you go any bigger on the hook, you don't get the bite. So, it's the old catch 22 situation. He's kiting right through these weeds now. Gently does it. Yes, now he's coming. He's in the weeds, but he's if you hold these barbel in tight, invariably they'll, they'll come through the weeds gently. Now that fish has come through the weeds on a two and a half pound line to an 18 hook. This is a barbel, give it about two and a half pound. There we are. Not a bad fish at all. I can just see that little hook in the scissors of his mouth. But uh, better use a gorget on this one. Here we are. Nice barbel, two and a half pounds. Weed all over him. One or two little lice just on the tail end there. You can see that this one has been in a keep net before. His, his tail ripped up just a little bit, that little bind on the tail there is not natural. And also the dorsal fin. One or two little tic tacs there. I think that mainly that's because um, a lot of anglers do tend to use keep nets to, to wider mesh. Whereas this one, it's a very fine mesh, very fine mesh. And that stops the barbel's dorsal fin hooking up in it so much. Whereas the wider mesh nets, the little bits and pieces along the uh, dorsal fin of the fish do tend to stick in. They've got like little sore, sore edges on them. Just slide them into the bit of deeper water. That's fine. You'll notice the delightful colours of our seven weed. And how rod rests swivel round when you don't want them to. Bit of hemp and the old casters. Single caster. And away we go. That's nearly enough on the sixpence that I cast the last one onto. That's nice. Yeah, that's settled down fine. Would you believe it? I'm looking down there and there's bubbles down there. Hang on. Hang on. That's a bite. That's a drop back. Not a bad fish. Certainly not a barbel. Yeah, could could be a chub. It's a nice one. Could be a roach or a perch or a bream, I suppose, but uh, I think it's a chub. They've got pretty soft mouths, I find, some of these summer chub, and with the 18 hook, I don't want to give it too much stick. He's bouncing a bit, he's uh, looking down for some snags, I think. Sometimes difficult to these chub out of these snags. This is a pretty lively fish. A very lively fish, very lively fish. Just got to watch it now, it's coming to the net as I would have liked it to. It's, um, into these weeds that are butting into the, of the edge of this bank. 
I think he's snagged the feeder up there. I got a bouncing no matter what. Now then, what I'm going to do now, I've got the depth to do. I'm just go for a little walk, I think. See if I can ease him out to the weeds. It's not the fish that's snagged, I don't think, so much as the feeder. With only a two and a half pound hook length, it. Uh, as long as it's the feeder that's snagged, I've got no problem because the real line. Come on, come on, Mr. Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, it was the feeder. Got three quarters of a ton of weed, I think. Now the fish has come. That's nice, that's nice. Yeah, I think he's all right. I think the weeds knocked a bit of the stuffing out of him, which makes life a little bit easier. That's that long green weed that's on the edge of the first shelf. I was there in some profusion on this river. Lovely golden fish. That really is a nice one. It's a beaut, that is. It's probably one of the cleanest chub I've caught for many, many a long time. Yep, nice one. Touch of the uh, this gorgeous. Yep, nice clean fish. About two pound, I would think. Now then, um, I'm going to ignore them fish out there. I know I've had two fish. I know I've had a chub and a barbel in the last chuck. That's two chucks. But I'm going to go for those barbel that have come onto that imp seed that I've thrown in. So, make the hook safe. I keep referring to this making the hook safe. But invariably when I poke them up, I go and hook myself. Put that there for a little bit. I... That lot's all ready. What I'm going to do now is bait up, chuck out, and I'm going to put a bait apron on. Because, uh, this method some requires some constant feeding of casters. Just cast over the baited area slightly to give it time to settle down. That's fine, that's lying on the bottom. I will hurt it to just hang in the water just a little bit there while I change things around. Got a bait apron somewhere. There we are. Quite handy things these bait aprons. Save all the constant bending down all the time onto that, especially in the rain, snow, etc. And full of casters. It's wise, obviously, when feeding with caster, especially in this deepish water. To throw it a couple of meters upstream from where the hemp was thrown in because the casters take so much longer to get down to the uh, bottom of the river. That is a result of chucking it in the water in the weed. Coming out slowly now. Yep, that's it. Oh, that's nice, that's better. Again, it's a uh, matter of laying this, casting out, controlling it so the float is always upstream of the shot and the hook bait. And of course with this bulk shot it does take a lot less time to go down than with a normal dotted out type of float rig. A little bit more feed. I think I'm laying on that carpet of hemp seed just nice now. Some one or two bubbles are still coming up, still some barbel down there. Which is the beauty of this method, really. I, I can actually see where my fish are, so to speak. I know they're there, by virtue of the bubbles coming up. Whereas with a cruncher chucking out the pig, um, you don't know. It's very much a chuck and chance it method. My terminology for it, anyway. But I know fish are down there because these bubbles are still coming up. I still think the stick float. I grew up on the stick float and all the new modern methods 
pole fishing to a certain extent, feeder fishing. Um, not really my game, I don't enjoy it and I think that's what fishing for me is all about enjoyment. If I don't enjoy it, I just don't like doing it. Certainly my favourite method. I bought the shot, they sit in about six inches above the bed of the river and the last two foot, the actual terminal tackle, the 18 hook, it's actually lying on the bottom with the casters and the hemp seed that are already down there. And down it goes, two foot, that's a nice fish. I don't think it's a barbel, I think it's a nice big fish, certainly not a barbel. Very nice for another bit, take it a bit careful, it's, it's a chub, that's a chub, okay, it's going for the root, so that willow tree just below me. A pound and a half line, again 18 hook, I'm going to try to keep this fish out a little bit. He's picked up a twig, certainly found the root okay, I think it's a bit of dead root fortunately, it's broken away. And what with a little bit of weed, I think we could have some problems on our hands. <clears throat> he's uh, gone down a bit solid again. Yet yeah, he's freed himself, that's fine. Lost the twig. Nice chub. Very really nice chub. He's boring, I must let him go a bit unfortunately. It's, um... Oh, it's a beautiful chub that one here. Yeah. I've got a good voice, I sing, I feel that good about catching a fish like that. But even I don't like me singing, so I won't bother with it, I don't think. <clears throat> Beautiful big fish. That is a nice fish in anybody's book. Nice fins, a little bit ripped up on the anal fin there, but there's probably it's all to scouring the bottom for food at this time of the year. Nice fish. About two pound that one. <clears throat> Up the casters again. Have to be too fussy about these putting these casters on with these uh well they're not like roach, a little bit of meat sticking out. Don't seem to bother them too much. Problem always with this type of fish in this weed, but the old adage, where there's weed, there's fish. If I can settle it all down once again. I think the feeding pattern is of not too great importance when fishing line on like this. It's a matter of keeping some feed going in. But the hem seed, that's that, that's the killer. That's 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 the one that counts. Yep, that's nice, that's a baited area, that's lovely. Lovely way of fishing for barbel this is. Strangely enough, I don't seem to lose too many. I think a, b a big thing about it is the rod's normal float rod, normal 13 foot float rod, normal pound and a half real lime. When these big fish start bouncing about, they give me the impression that they don't know they're hooked. In actual fact, on more than one occasion, I've been playing a fish for a long time, a barbel, and I've thrown in some casters, and as they've been dropping through the water, the hook fish have still been feeding. You can feel it dashing about, the rod bouncing along here and there. Maybe phenomenal, but perfectly true. I had settled down nicely, that has. Just give me a few more. Um, no, I won't. No, I won't. That's a tickle. That's a tickle. That's a tickle. Go on. Go on. Yep. Oh my God. This is a granddad. is a nice fish. Gotta be a little bit careful with this one. As all barbel do, this one is going in a straight line. I hate, hate to rush these fish. If I start bullying them as I would with maybe a feeder rig or a meat rig, it would now to know very well he was hooked, and I know he ducked to be off like a shot. But with the float rod, um, can tend to do a little bit more with them. Easy, easy. Can't do too much with this fish. He's a uh, he's a master of the situation at the moment. <laughs> he's going towards these weed beds. I got it. 
be very, very careful now, extreme. I'm just going to walk out. I'm going to use a length of the rod to go over the edge of this weed. If I get my knees wet, it's my own fault. Um, yeah, it is pulsing quite nice. Coming up just a little bit. He's coming up. Even a barbel can't go, go through a thick bank of weed like that. Can get stuck in it. Nice fish, nice fish. Quite a good fish this one, actually. It's amazing what you can do with a pound and a half line. People don't realise. They think to catch a barbel like this when it tops. I would think it's about four pounds at the moment. They think you've got to use four pound line, which is obviously not true. It's, um, it's the rod that takes up the plunge of the line. Of course, it's got its nostril. Like, oh, look at that. Oh my god. I was going to say the fish has got a natural, the line has got a natural elasticity to it. That's a lovely fish. Oh, yes, I've waited for this one for a long, long time. Come on, old mate, I'm not going to hurt you. Nearly done, nearly done. I've got to. This is a danger time now when a barbel sees a net, they can go a little bit berserk. And off in a mad run, so I've left the line in the bail in the pin off position just in case he wants. I don't think he's going to. He's bellied up, he's nice, and I've got him. What a beautiful fish! I think I use that word beautiful maybe a bit too much, but um, there ain't no other word to describe a fish like that. That is a belter weed as well. Fish for all season. If you cook with that 18 hook, I've got to uh, use my gorget on it again. And there he goes. That's a beaut. That's a real beaut. Things about five and a half pounds, I would think. Nice fish. There you go, then, old mate. Just ease into that deeper water a little bit. And down he goes. Important, obviously, to keep the end of the keep not staked out in this uh, shallow type of bay swim. It's even left me casters on there. Very nice of him. Okay, double cast it. And away we go once more. And full to keep him interested. That's clean down nice. What a cracking day today, I've really enjoyed it. In a normal five hour match, as regards amount of bait, I'd be looking to use a gallon of hemp, minimum of six pints of casters. It's a matter again of balancing the bait out to keep them hungry, don't give them too much, but give them enough so they don't run away. Fishing, I think, should be like this all the time. Where you catch and land nearly every fish you hook. Especially fish like that lovely thing in there. It's going to be dark now, mind. I'm uh, struggling to see the end of that float, actually. It's always beautiful to fish this part of the river, any time of the day. There we are. Yeah, it's well looked. Oh, it's not a barbel. No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's even a chill, but... Bouncing around a little bit, I must say. Oh, it's a little perch. It's a nice little perch. That, I think, is my last fish of the day, thinking about it, because if there's perch in any swim like that, there's certainly any barbel. That's my experience of it, anyway. Perch, barbel and chub just do not go together. Oh, nice little fish. Beautiful colour. Lovely little coloured thing, that one. But uh, the light's going a little bit. A perch is a perch. And I think perches are lone fish. Well, that's just about it. Perch certainly don't mix with barbel. In actual fact, I think they'll be antisocial perch. They do seem to be a little bit of a lone of fish. I think I've just had about had enough for today. Looks like I've got a bit of a tangle on this lot now anyway. It's been a great day really, I've thoroughly enjoyed it.
I'd like to say every day is like this, but unfortunately isn't I have as many dry ends as the next bloke. But uh, today's been marvellous, it's been great, really enjoyed it. Some nice boats, nice people waving on the way past. <coughs> what I'm going to do now is have a look at what we've got in the net. Get the hardware out of the way first. Here we go, got to be a little bit gentle with them just in case. Oh, still a bit lively these fish. There's another bin there all day. Little perch, just about the most lively of the lot, I would think. I'm going to lose that bank stick. Oh, it's a nice net of fish there. Very quickly, at a rough guess, I'd say there's about 25 pound there. Probably needed to 30. That's a nice net of fish.